What do you feel about other techniques and the mixing of other techniques into this path of Bhagavan? Somebody once asked Bhagavan whether he should sit and meditate all day doing inquiry and Bhagavan laughed and said, try, try it and see your vasanas won't let you. Vasanas are the mental propensities that push your mind out in different directions. So Bhagavan himself uh, was the first to admit that most people didn't have the mental maturity to sit and do inquiry all day or even to incorporate it in their daily life. Now that there's a very interesting story that uh, Kanji Swami told. He was Bhagavan's attendant for 12 years and at the end of those 12 years he suddenly felt an urge to go to Palakotu and start practicing self-inquiry in Palakotu. Now up till that point he'd been serving Bhagavan, looking at washing his clothes, looking after the old hall and Bhagavan approved of this decision uh, he said, this is very good. Don't think that serving your guru means washing his clothes, bringing him food, all these things. Serving the guru means carrying out his teachings. And the teachings that Kanju Swami wanted to put into practice were Bhagavan's teachings on inquiry. So with Bhagavan's blessings, Kanju Swami went off to Palakotu and began a life of meditation. Then sometime later, he approached Bhagavan and said, Bhagavan, I find I can't do self-inquiry all the time, so at the times when my mind is resistant to inquiry, then I read good spiritual books, I do parayana, I chant scriptural works. And Bhagavan himself said, very good, the mind can't be kept inquiry, in inquiry all the time, it's very good that you take up these uh, ancillary practices in the times when your mind can't be kept on the inquiry, because the important thing is that you not let your mind be restless, that you not let it wander off at the times when it's not focused enough to do inquiry properly. So in, in this answer there is a hierarchy. If your mind is in a good state, if it's in a sattvic state, if it's receptive, then make it do inquiry. Even if it's hard work, persist. But there will be times when it's not possible uh, and then those times Bhagavan said, just don't let your mind run away with you just because you can't do inquiry properly. Read a good book, do your japa, do your parayana. Just don't let the mind be dissipated, keep it focused. And in the really good times, when your mind is quiet, then focus on inquiry and you'll get good results then. Yes, I agree, David. I think this is a very important uh, teaching for Kunja Swami. And um, it makes it quite clear that a quiet mind in itself is the purpose. Maybe we should work out what makes self-inquiry so special by putting the focus on the subject rather than the object. Would you like to talk about that? Ah, very good. This is a very important distinction in Bhagavan's teachings. He said that the reason why self-inquiry works and that other techniques don't is that other techniques allow the eye to rise and get hold of an object of contemplation. So if you are chanting somebody's name or worshipping a statue, I, the subject, is fixated or concentrated on a name or some holy image of some sort. So he said there's a distinction between what he called meditation, which is an existing established risen I, attaching itself to and associating with an object of contemplation. So he said that is never going to get rid of the I. He said the only way to make the I subside is to take away all of the associations it has with objects, including holy objects. So this gets back to the core question of why does inquiry work and why, according to Bhagavan, do other techniques not work when it comes to realizing the self. He said, for the self to be realized, the I has to subside into the heart and be consumed by the self, and the I will not subside so long as it's focusing on any kind of object, even a holy object. So he said that you can meditate, you can worship an image of God, you can do japa, you can fill yourself with love for the divine, but throughout that there's an experiencer, there's someone who has the experience, and that experiencer might be having a wonderful, blissful, happy experience, 
but it's still an experience of something and that experiencer isn't going to subside until it gives up all the associations it has with outside objects including all objects associated with God. So this is a rather fundamentalist view of religious practice. Bhagavan says in one of his Aladu Napadu verses that devotion to form enables you to see God in a particular form and no more. If you want to get the true experience, the one who is devoted to the form has to subside into the self and disappear. So he said devotion to form can wear away your I thought, your sense of individuality, but it's never really going to produce the final result of extinction of the I because that risen I is always holding on to a form which gives some kind of bliss, some kind of happiness and so long as that bliss and happiness is there there's an extreme reluctance and unwillingness to take that I back to the self. It in a sense becomes addicted to name and form, it becomes addicted to a form of worship and it's not too extreme to say that that makes the I survive and in some cases makes it even stronger. What Bhagavan is saying is that you must eliminate the experiencer who has the good experiences of God. You must take the experiencer back into the self and have it be extinguished there by the power of the self. So this is why there's this absolute dichotomy in Bhagavan's teachings between inquiry, which makes the I go back, and all other practices which use an extroverted eye to latch onto objects. <laughs>